Welcome to the presidential wing of the Gentleman Hackers Mansion Ula Moistil. In this series, we'll cover some of the notable information security trends, as well as discuss the inevitable cyber mayhem. Tonight's guides to the underground of the internet are the grandmasters of the hacker scene, Mikko Hyppönen. Good evening. And Tomi Tuominen. Good evening and welcome. Now, we've been doing this podcast for a number of years in Finnish, but this time we're doing a special episode in English with a very special guest. And the guest is President of Estonia, Thomas Hendrik Ilves. And I first time met Mr. President in 2009. And I remember this because I blogged about it at the time. I met him at the EU Ministerial Conference on Critical Information Infrastructure Protection. And as I quote my blog post at the time, I say here that I was really impressed by the talk given by Mr. Ilves. It was a rhetorically sound and masterfully executed talk by an European statesman. And even though it was on the topic of my own expertise, I still found it insightful. It was also refreshing to listen to him mention technical details like botnets, DNSSEC and denial of service attacks. Impressive. So my very first impression of President Ilves was that here's a president who knows technology. I've also met Thomas back in 2013 at an event called Cyberstrat. We were both on stage, he was prior to me there, and after his talk he actually stayed around and we had a few drinks together. And I still remember that I was also impressed not only by his technical abilities or like understanding of technology, but also his worldview. He understood extremely well how the world worked and how global politics impacted the world that we live in. Yeah, yeah. I think it's time to invite the president in. Welcome, President Thomas Hendrik Ilves. Good morning. Mr. President, it's nice to meet you again. Would it be okay if we call you Thomas? Please, go ahead. Would you mind telling us your story? How did you end up where you are right now? Well, at my age, it's already pretty long. Um, but I was born in Sweden of Estonian refugees uh, who then uh, uh, moved to the United States in 1950. I was born in late 53 and uh, 1956, 57, they moved to the United States. And I grew up in New Jersey in what, uh, despite my accent, uh, which is not like that, but I would, uh, in an area that I call Soprano land, and everybody talked like uh, Tony Soprano. And I think I did too, but um, anyway, I got rid of that when, when I was in university and a professor said, uh, Thomas, you don't, you're not nearly as stupid as you sound. And then I decided <laughs> it was time to change my work on my accent. Anyway, I went to Colombia, grew up, um, I mean, I had grown up in the United States. And, but the really, I think, uh, what really changed everything for me, which I didn't realize at the time, and which probably ended up changing Estonia, was that in, mm, when I was 15, I was in a math class with a math teacher who was doing a PhD in math education at Teachers College at Columbia. And she, for her thesis, had this project, which was to see if you could teach kids to code. And so there was this uh, class of, I'd say, what, you know, somewhat better math students, and I was one of them. And she uh, rented a teletype with uh, perfo tape, mm -hmm. a big telephone modem about uh, 60 centimeters by, uh, by 20 <laughs> centimeters so that you would what, stick. What, what year is this, roughly? 1971. Okay, all right. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, she, we learned basic. Basic, it was only a year and a half old when this right. came out. And uh, which baby Fortran, for those who don't know that, this, I don't know, I think they'd still teach it. But. In any case, so uh, for me, the, uh, the moment, the uh, kind of the aha moment was uh, I had to, there was an assignment uh, to, <laughs> to program y equals x squared, <laughs> print. And I forgot to put end. <laughs> so hmm. it was like... Oh, so I was looping. So it was just going, 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 right. going, and all this. And then I, I, I obviously stopped. Um, but I said, wow, I did that. That's amazing. 
And from there on in, uh, I mean, it wasn't that I was I was particularly good at it. I am not particularly good at it, but um, I, I, I've never, after that, I never feared anything that had to do with IT. Because most of my life was actually more in the kind of social, humanitarian area, mm -hmm. and it was no big deal. And maybe we can talk about that two cultures thing later on. But in any case, um, and then I went to university, and one day when I was in my, I guess, third year, there was a little file card on the bulletin board in the psychology department where I was uh, doing experiments, and it said, looking for programmer. And I said, oh, that can't be too hard. So I went there, and uh, it was, um, it was, uh, the job was to create a program to convert um, eye movement data, which were in polar coordinates, into Cartesian coordinates. And of course, and it was one of the first lab computers ever that was used in like a department. It was a PDP-8 with uh, mm -hmm. PDP-8, which was about a, <laughs> a meter and a little more wide and about, uh, well, 20 centimeters high and then about 50 center, 60 centimeters <laughs> deep and had big fat tape of about, uh, I don't know, what was that, two centimeter tape? And it, the reason why it was called a PDP-8, produced by DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, it had 8K of memory, which is less than an empty email today. Mm. And so because of that, and because of the computing power of that computer, I had to program in, um, in Assembler. Oh. <laughs> so it was, I mean, it's, you know, Hexadecimal. <laughs> it was well. First, I had to learn how to how to code in assembler, which was a, interesting. Much more different than uh, much more difficult than basic. And then I had to figure out how the hell to create this uh, program. Uh, but anyway, that was my summer job. But after that, it was like, oh come on, this is just stuff. It, this is not hard. And, uh, and, af and after that, I mean, I never felt intimidated by anything that had to do with IT. I mean, it could be challenging, it could be very hard to understand, but it was never like, oh my God, it's technology. And so it was kind of natural that when I got, uh, had for the first time a little bit of money, I bought my first computer in 1983, which was an Apple IIe. And except for the time I had been forced uh, to use um, other products, um, as in working for the government, uh, Estonian government in the 90s, I have uh, always used only Apple mm -hmm. just because I got used to it. And I've, so anyway, that, you know, what I, the rest, and then, I mean, a lot of years went by. I was hired by Radio Free Europe uh, initially as an analyst on Baltic affairs because this was after Ronald Reagan said, oh, we have to get the Soviet Union. So he put a lot of money into uh, radio, and I was hired as an analyst. And I wrote articles and lots of analytic articles about this area. And then I was made... Um, uh, the head of the Estonian service. I was there on the kind of the research side, and, and then I was head of the radios, and then, and for the Finnish audience, uh, I was kind of the wild and crazy guy at the radios. I was younger by 16 years than every than any other director. And one of the things I had done was, um, and this is all for the Finnish audience. Mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the high uh, the the frequency modulated signal in. Um, in the Soviet Union was much lower than in, in frequency than in the West. It was actually the police band in Finland or in Europe or mm -hmm. the United States, uh, which is like 70, 80, up to 80 megahertz, but then we have like 88 until 106 or whatever. Estonian radio and Estonian TV. Uh, we're all on the Soviet system and PAL, mm -hmm. um, which is different from, anyway, the system you have in Europe. Uh, but Estonian engineers then came up with this thing to at least listen to Finnish television and watch te Finnish television uh, because, uh, the, in fact, one of the IT guys here who's done all kinds of stuff, his father uh, built these little 
boxes, and converters. So everyone mm -hmm. had a converter. Right. And so when I was at the radios, I first I got smuggled, as they were forbidden, um, an Orkeon radio, which was a uh, portable uh, Soviet um, FM radio. And then I sent it to Finland, and then I had a friend in Helsinki who I would then... The, I mean, the other anomaly was Estonia was the only place uh, in the Soviet Union and actually almost all of the Eastern Bloc, except for Germany, that could see Western television. Mm -hmm. And this had, by the way, an enormous impact on Estonia. And people say, why is Estonia different from everybody else? One of them, I would say, a key message is Finnish TV, which had two effects, I think. Had many effects, but two main ones. Number one is the incredibly obnoxious uh, habit of, um, or practice, at least in the 1980s, of Finnish meat advertising. Or uh, you would just pan over red cuts of meat with the prices in, uh, in Marka. Mm -hmm. And you said, meanwhile, here in Estonia, uh, you couldn't buy any meat, or if you did, you could buy a pig's head with the cheeks cut out because that's meat. And so you're sitting here in Tallinn and you're looking at this like, you know, red beef, pork, it's just like, and the, the commercial would last like two minutes <laughs> and, you, and you can sit here. <laughs> uh, capitalism may not be so bad, thought many Estonians. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other big effect of Finland, which then has, re has reverberated throughout, is that um, like uh, many smaller coastal countries, uh, interestingly, fin Finnish TV uh, did not dub uh, American programs mm -hmm. or anything. It doesn't dub. It has subtitles, but um, uh, which had the effect of that Estonians, at least in Northern Estonia, all knowing Finnish, I mean, because we're so closely related, it's mm -hmm. basically German and Dutch or Spanish and Portuguese. So everyone understood Finnish and they would then read the subtitles of American programs. Uh, mainly they watched Dallas and Dynasty, um, which also created an interesting image among Estonians of what life was in uh, in uh, the West, especially in <coughs> the United States, and various Estonians who were among, I mean, Estonians were among the most successful immigrant group in the United States. Uh, after Jews and Armenians uh, looked at ethnically, they were they had the highest GDP hmm. per capita. And so they were rather well off uh, in the 1980s. But in Est when Estonian visited their rich Western relatives, they'd go, oh, you only have two, a two-car garage? You know, you poor people. Because <laughs> their idea of America was Dallas. Uh, but in any case, the language part was extremely important. So English language knowledge among Estonians was, was very high already in the late 80s. Uh, so anyway, that was Finland, and that um, I was I was at the radios, and what I did there with this Aukian radio and an unlimited budget, I would call. I mean, listening to anything that was going on news, but especially in the 19, in eighty nine, ninety, ninety one, um, I would just uh, call up my friend in Helsinki, and he would put the phone next to his radio. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we would listen there for hours, you know, Estonian independence. We listened to the whole thing going on and because it was just carried live on TV. Mm -hmm. And we're all going, oh, wow. <laughs> so this, I did have like a multi hundred thousand dollar telephone bill, but they said it was okay. So <laughs> anyway, that was the radios. And then because I'd been working and helping all kinds of people in Estonia throughout the 1980s, among them Lennart Meri, who I actually met for the first time in Espoo in 1985. Very secret, very secret. And then, um, and then he said, and I, I'd written some of his speeches uh, already before independence. And, and, um, and then he said, look, um, what are you doing there? You're, you're sitting there living in comfortable, you know, Deutschland, making a lot of money and telling us what we're doing wrong. 
why don't you come work for us? So I said, oh, I mean, morally, you're right. I can't really justify this. And I then, uh, well, I quit my, I quit Radio Free Europe, took a 95% cut in pay, went off to be a poor, poor East European diplomat in the United States, the first uh, Estonian uh, ambassador in Washington since 1925, actually. And it was rather interesting, you know, especially when the foreign ministry didn't pay us or didn't transfer <laughs> money and we'd live on credit cards until they did and the bank wouldn't, you know, they allowed us to not pay our rent and all these things. And <laughs> so I did that and then my main job there was getting Russian troops out of Estonia and then after that, I, Leonard uh, called me back and said, you have to become Estonian foreign minister because people are... Didn't, didn't think much of most people who were in politics and, I mean, their knowledge of foreign affairs. And then, and I came back and then, um, and I had uh, decided or I had gotten to the point where I realized in the United States that there was no way we would join NATO, which was the, the one and only foreign policy goal of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. It was all NATO, 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 NATO. And I said, no, you're never going to get into NATO unless you're in the European Union. And that, and not because the European Union is, offers security, but it's just that Germany, France, Italy, UK cannot veto your accession to NATO if you're in the European Union. So we must go into the European Union. In the European Union, we actually have a chance of getting in as long as we are always at least as good as Poland, because there is the political decision that, you know, or, I mean, in Germany, that we will take Poland. And whereas NATO is a political decision uh, to join it or not, in the EU, there was kind of, there were things such as objective criteria about various things. Mm -hmm which I said, on all things they measure, we must be at the same level. All right. I mean, but where all of the, where the real, I mean, that was nice. And I, I mean, later on I became president. But I did all the stuff that I did that was important to Estonia in the 1990s. And the other side of what is important and which will, um, which is why uh, I guess the tech community here is, it was sort of relates to me the way it does, is that um, Estonia was incredibly poor, as I mentioned. In 1938, the last year, a uh, full year before World War II, if it's in the Cambridge Economic History of the United States, there's a graph which shows that Estonia has a higher GDP per capita than Finland. Not much, but a little bit. Mm. I can show you the graph later. Mm. Um, that beat was even higher, but okay. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, they don't know that. But the Finns don't know that. Yes, we don't. Well, but what we are learning now. I'll show you, because uh, I, I like to give that in talks that have Finns. <laughs> <laughs> but the important point is in 1992, the first full year of, of reestablished independence, the GDP per capita of Finland was 24,000 US dollars. The GDP per capita of, of Estonia was 2,800, so an eight-fold difference in GDP per capita, which gives, shows you the joys of communism, right? Mm. I mean, um, so all that development that didn't happen as, a, as not only were, were we poor, but then you have Zeno's paradox, which is, uh, there are many Zeno's paradoxes, but there's the one of Achilles and the tortoise, where Achilles, never catches up to the tortoise because he always runs half the distance, but the tortoise also runs half the distance. And so Achilles will, no matter if he's the fastest in the world, he will never catch up to the tortoise. And that is the problem that you face in development, which is that, fine, we could have 10% growth a year, but if Finland has, you know, half a percent, it's still going to be ahead. And also half a percent of 24,000 US dollars as opposed to 10% of $2,800. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it was pretty bleak. And I was figuring, what is it that we need to do? And then another thing happened, which was the uh, sort of the, that really kicked me off in, uh, in this direction was that Mosaic came out. Mosaic was the first web browser. 
Uh, Hypertext uh, tra uh, transfer protocol was invented in 1989 by Tim Berners-Lee, but no one could use it because mm -hmm. there wasn't there were no web browsers. And this was the first first commercially available web browser. It appeared in you know, June, July of 1993, and a friend of mine was uh, teaching at Champaign Urbana, where Mark Andreessen had created it, and he he wrote me an email and said, "Ah, oh, you should check this thing out. It's really cool." So I said, wow, okay. And I went to the Radio Shack, which was the store that used to exist uh, before uh, online shopping. And for, I don't know, something twenty nine ninety five, I, I bought this package of seven floppies. And I uploaded <laughs> them. And I had the web browser. And I said, wow, look at this. This is amazing. And then I started looking, well, this is, I mean, you know, then looking around and I mean, even, even sort of using Alta Vista or some kind of search engine, it's like, I realized that this is, this doesn't, no one, there is none of this anywhere. Mm, there's and, no content. Well, there's no content and no one has this. Mm -hmm. and, and finally I found a page that lo actually looked at sort of number of domains and, and, uh, were like no domains. I mean, there were you know, a thousand domains in the United States. And there is this hit me and said, this is one place, one place where we are on a level playing field with everybody else. All other things, road infrastructure, you know, crap, terrible roads. You know, I mean, built hospital infrastructure, communication infrastructure. I mean, we had a 1938 telephone exchange here. And in fact, Finland, Helsinki, the city of Helsinki offered to give us for free a, to, to Estonia the uh, 1979, that is like a 12, 13-year-old telephone system. Um, so I say, a big gift. I had a huge fight with the government from Washington saying, no, no, no. <laughs> And they said, why not? And I said, because it's legacy technology. Do not take legacy technology. This was what happened after World War I. After World War II, the Brits took the help. Well, Brits and the French took half the industrial plant of Germany in, 19, uh, in the Versailles Treaty in 1919, mm -hmm. 1920. So the Brits and the, uh, Brits and the French took half the infrastructure, the industrial plant. Mm. And I remember reading, I think they retired the last uh, sort of 1890s mechanical printing press in the UK, which they had taken from Germany, uh, like sort of in the 1990s. So it was 100 years old. And what did the Germans do? They just built everything again. And they were, it was better because new engineering and better technology. And then they did the same thing after World War II. Um, well, the Soviets did, because they took the stuff, otherwise it was all bombed out. But the point is that you do not take legacy technology, no matter how cheap it is, and that's like one primary lesson. And I have been telling people ever since, do not take legacy technology, do not buy legacy technology. That was the beginning of what uh, then, um, I mean, I sort of started thinking of all of these things, and I call it, I learned to code at 15. I've never been afraid of computers. This is the one area where Estonia is starting out exactly in the same place as everybody else. And I said, okay, how do we use that? And I said, I know. Why don't we put computers in all the schools and connect all of them? And, um, and then uh, everyone laughed. It was, what a ridiculous idea. Uh, but then, I mean, I kept pushing this thing, saying, yes, we got to do it. And then uh, bas basically, then that Mary was one of the few people who said, oh, it's not a bad idea. But uh, having a, the kind of president that we have here with no uh, executive authority, I mean, he's, uh, and then we had a new education minister, Jak Avix, who's a PhD in astrophysics um, and gets stuff. <laughs> And so um, I told, uh, we had a long night. Uh, there were three of us, uh, Jak, uh, uh, Johnny, and, and, and me. Um, Jak obviously saw Johnny Walker and, and I. <laughs> yes, we know Johnny, yes. 
<laughs> and we <clears throat> we had a long discussion of this, and we drew out how to do it and how it would much it would cost more or less, and if we buy in bulk and. And we came up with, a, I, I pushed for a matching program that, you know, if you just buy it and give it to schools, it'll sit there and get dusty. But if they have, you know, skin in the game, if mm -hmm. they, you have to buy half the, uh, pay half of it, they will actually care. And so uh, it was rolled out in 96, in 1996. By 1998, all Estonian schools were, had computer labs and were online. So that's, when I say why the tech community in this country kind of looks on me as the old guy who, you know, sort of pushed this. And then I, in 2016, when I was uh, ending my term, I, um, I, I went around and I was, by that time I was visiting, I mean, I would, we had a huge startup scene here. So I would go visit startups all the time and say, good job, good job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I started asking them, so how did you get into this? And what I, basically 80% of the time, these men and women in their late 20s, early 30s would say, oh, I was a kid in your program. <laughs> I learned to code. And I mean, my whole thinking was that what will happen is that, you know, they will get computers. 90% of them will basically play games. But 4 to 8% will start tearing it apart. And what is going on here? And that's exactly what happened. So we produced a generation of geeks mm -hmm. because they wanted to figure out how it worked. And so that was called the Tiger Leap. And that's why. All these people in this country in IT sort of look upon me as the that silly old guy who came up with this idea that got us all on computers. So you were the president from 2006 Six, yeah. to 2016. Yeah, but so. I, this all stuff happened when I was, I mean, it was actually ancillary to being either ambassador or, or foreign minister. Mm -hmm. This was just my other thing, which has always been my other thing, which was tech. How do you see your role today? One is uh, you know, sort of being a proselytizer for digitization for development, which, I mean, I go around and say, look, people, you want to get out of the hole you're in, you should digitize. Fighting stupidity in the European Union on tech legislation, especially security. We can talk about sideloading, which mm -hmm. is something which I find is like, I mean, a big problem in the European Union, which has to do with... Um, passing 20th century legislation to deal with the uh, problems of the 21st century they, that the, the legislators have no clue about. Hmm. So, I mean, there is, no, there is no concern about security in the European Union passing uh, all kinds of legislation. Uh, that's another role, I don't know, I mean, I teach. So, hold on, where, where do you teach now? Tartu University. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, basically, I'm trying to develop a program there on some of the course, the things I've taught in the last five or six years. Um, and we're trying to get started a, something that we call, or I call an MDA, which is not ecstasy, but it's <laughs> um, a Master's in Digital Administration. I mean, this jumps ahead to like things, but may, I would argue that that with the introduction of digitization and with a distributed data exchange layer, which is the only way you can do things, um, any other way is really stupid. Uh, you have you have uh, completely turned on its head bureaucracy since it was first invented with cuneiform tablets or papyrus or whatever they had 5,000 years ago. Because bureaucracy has been, because of the medium, has always been a serial or sequential process. You go to an office, hand in a paper, someone looks at the paper, gives it to the next office, they look at it and they open the file. Is it, is it right? Is it wrong? And then it goes on. And, um, and suddenly you can do the running governance in, in parallel. And to understand what that means is actually the guy who 
um, one of the designers of, uh, of X-Road, or actually it's implementation, which is much harder. But uh, he had a kid born in like 1999. And he said the worst experience of his life was running from the hospital to, like the, to get a birth certificate, <clears throat> going with the birth certificate to the health insurance. Go, I mean, just all these processes mm -hmm. you had to go. And he said, I'm never going to do that again. Uh, that was horrible, especially because it was winter and all this other stuff, which, you know, it's not fun. And so when we have with our digital governance, one of the things is there, the way, what happens if a child is born and the hospital said, what's his or her name? And that's all you have to do because then the hospital informs the population registry that assigns an ID to this name and connect it to all the various services. It automatically kicks off the health insurance, automatically registers you in, uh, in wherever your parents live, uh, automatically, um, as, as you already like, the school system knows you exist. You get a birth, paper birth certificate because we still have to deal with the paper world outside of Estonia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all those things. And, and okay, but to go back to the things that, governance is completely different now, or can be completely different. It isn't actually. But it is, it can be in this, it, you, we can rethink governance. Uh, we can think, rethink elections. We can rethink all kinds of things in the public sector. And while you have had huge rethinks in the private sector with, I mean, all of the, everything that has to do with, with uh, the digital world and the private sector, that is the digital revolution of the past 50 years. But in the public sector, it is a complete and utter disaster, and we are as primitive today as we were. Now, the, the example of this is uh, after I was president, I was invited to go to Stanford and talk about these things. And then my uh, younger daughter came and was going to go to school in, uh, in uh, Palo Alto uh, at Gunn High School. Where I live was basically in a 12-kilometer radius of the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, YouTube, and uh, not to mention Sand Hill Road and all the money, mm -hmm. and you know, I don't know how many hundred other, you know, almost unicorns. So how was it like living there in the middle of the Silicon Valley? Well, this is what I'm getting to. Then my daughter, I had to register my daughter for school. And so then I, I had to take my electricity bill, which had my address on it. And then I drove to the headquarters of the school district. And then I got there, and then they took a number, and then I waited, and then I, was, I had to give the woman my electricity bill, my passport with a visa, with a copy of the visa of my daughter, uh, who was to go to high school, and something called the DS-2019 form, which, said, which is given out by the State Department saying, I am employed by Stanford University. And then she took all these papers, and then she went away. And then she, 10 minutes later, she came back. She had made photocopies. And then she sat down, and then she started copying out by hand all of the relevant data that she needed. I said, I am in the mecca of IT. This is the center of all things IT, except for maybe it's something in China, but anyway, nowhere else. And I'm sitting here, and it's taking me an hour to register my daughter to go to school in Palo Alto, in the same high school as Steve Jobs' kids, by the way, and just about everyone else who lives mm. there. Uh, I said, this is ridiculous. The U.S. is in the 1950s. You know, okay, you could maybe in Arkansas, but this is Silicon Valley. This is the mecca of the world. And this is when, so when people say, well, why do you want to do public service? I go, because the public service is living in the 1950s. And the only thing that changed with uh, my registration process from 1950 was that a woman had a photocopy machine to make photocopies of my electricity bill. 
So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing today, is trying to design a master's program that actually will, it deals with, the, with public sector, public services, governance in the digital era. So you mentioned X-Road. I suppose that's one of the examples of, of Estonian success stories. But what else comes to mind of the digital revolution that has gone over here in Estonia over the last years? X-Road is actually a, a key part of, of digitization. And, um, I mean, so when I said that we got, I mean, I'll talk about how Estonia became so digital, which was that once the success of the Tiger Leap became apparent, um, the bank said, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and the problem in Estonia, which is, I mean, low population density, lots of small towns and villages. Uh, everyone has to have, each one has to have a bank or two actually, or three. And so, and this of course is very expensive. And they said, wow, we can, uh, we can, um, we get rid of all of these brick and mortar banks. So how do we do that? Well, we'll teach people to use computers. So a new program came, which was called See the World, which then which I also participated in, um, where we went around the countryside. And we go into a town, a little town, and we put out 80 or 100 computers on tables, and all the old people would show up because you get free tea and, hmm. and uh, cookies, and besides, see something interesting, and it's better than boring TV. And so they would come out, and we'd show people how to use computers. And then what we did was every municipal government office had a bank of computers in it and, you know, encouraged these to hire someone who could actually help old people. But the idea was that to get people off banks and to use computers. And, and this was especially important because, you know, in the 1990s, I mean, basically a you know, very small percentage of people had their own computers. Today, 95% per, uh, of households in Estonia have a PC. Um, but then there were none. So it was important to have uh, internet access points. Mm -hmm. And we still have some of the signs around that were out in the late 90s, early 80s, which is, it would say in Estonian and in English, internet access point with an arrow, um, pointing say 200 meters, and the sign of the internet access point was the at. Mm -hmm. So, and you can still see them here in Estonia, but they're not really that used that much because everyone's got their own laptop. Uh, but, and it became apparent that all this is very nice, but it is not secure. And this is really the fundamental issue of digitization of governance. We need two-factor authentication, end-to-end -end encryption. We need to have, everyone needs to have a digital identity. Mm -hmm. The political side of this is what I can get. And the political side of this, which is that everyone must have an ID. Everyone in your country. Now, this is a hard thing to push through, especially in a country like the United States, where it's, it's my right not to have an ID. Mm. Um, but see, unless you have an ID, I mean, a mandatory ID system, uh, what will happen in digitization is that... First, um, ministries will, will not be digitizing because they say, no one's using, no one has an ID, why should we digitize? And so they don't. And then, they, and then if, you, if it's a voluntary, uh, voluntary ID system, basically we find 20, 20, well, 15 to 25 percent of the population in Europe, if it's a voluntary ID, will take it. Mm -hmm. But even that is not enough because if you're, say, you know, whatever agency, you know, they'll say, Social welfare. It's like, why should I digitize? I mean, why should I digitize my services? No one has an ID. On the other hand, then the twenty-five percent say that. I mean, in a especially good country, twenty-five percent has a voluntary ID. You know, I mean, no services work. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, catch twenty-two chicken and egg mm -hmm. problem. So it must be everyone must have an ID. <clears throat> so we made it mandatory. Um, so that was the first step and politically very important. What is the first thing you need? You need to have an ID that is unique and secure, and that requires 2FA and end-to-end -end encryption. Um, the next, uh, and so the identity issue is fundamental and is a crucial stumbling block in all countries almost. Um, 
I was uh, helping Greece on this, and they said, "We'll never have an ID. We have such a system, and it's, there's a there is a a monopoly on the part of the Greek Orthodox Church because they have the biggest ID system, but it's they don't really have a system. They just have a piece of paper mm. with a picture stapled on it in a plastic bag." Um, <clears throat> and then came COVID, and suddenly it was like, "No, we have to have digital services." We, every, and so that was how. I mean, disaster, the disaster digitized uh, Greece. Hmm. Next thing is architecture. Now, um, uh, well, everyone's oh my God, it's a, a big, big data center has all the information. You go, no, 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 you don't do that. In fact, you know, the, the best reason not to have a big, big, any kind of big center is the OPM hack of 2015. Mm -hmm. 23 million records of U.S. federal employees, including the psychological profiles of CIA employees, mm -hmm. all there, all sucked out. And on top of that, it was in clear text. Sure. It wasn't even, I mean, this That's is still problematic <laughs> today. They're one of the biggest data leaks in history. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, breaches, I don't know, leaks. Leak, okay. leak is kind of like, you know, you know, you need diapers or something. Right, but, right. But uh, no, it's... Data thefts, maybe. Right. So we had these young guys in Tartu who said, wow, well, they developed a digital um, data exchange layer system. And if you, to understand how it is, is that basically everything is connected to everything. And it's all, all the connections in between everything are all encrypted. And when I say, if you want to visualize it, think of it as a, of all these Christmas balls hanging in space, not just to the Christmas tree, but every data, I mean, every bit of data is in a unique location that is unique to you, but also to the data, the datum or the information that's there. So I can access my medical records. The doctor that is authorized to look at my medical records can look at it. No one else can access it because they cannot even, I mean, because the data is close to anyone who is not me or an authorized person. And I can get it. I can authorize other people. But in any case, it is a distributed data exchange. And data is all over the place. But it all everything has a unique address that is uniquely labeled by with me and with whoever is authorized. And it can be accessed by me, but by no one else. And then we have uh, all those data are kind of in, arranged in, in uh, I mean, sort of distributed according to access. I mean, is it strictly private, semi-private, public? And the public data is, is based on uh, mutual or reciprocal transparency. So, for example, what horrifies, say, Southern Europeans, I go, well, all my property records are public. Oh, my God. Mm. I said, well, on the other hand, uh, anyone who looks at my property records is also public. So... You know, I mean, journalists, they love to see where, who's got, owns what. Mm -hmm. And... I, of course, can just say, oh, I see. Once again, this month, they're checking to see what I own. <laughs> and then, so I know who's looking at my data, mm -hmm. uh, which keeps people, I don't know if honest, but anyway, it, at least they know that uh, you can't just go in there and snoop. Um, people immediately say, what about privacy, privacy, privacy? And of course, we, this mutual reciprocity means that you have a record of everyone who has accessed your data. And while, and this is when we get into how I am utterly enraged by the lack of thinking by people in politics who know nothing about anything in digital affairs, is that I mean, take the example of, um, well, first of all, privacy. I mean, it's like, oh, Big Brother will find something out. And I go, well, I don't know. I mean, I know who's looking at my data, except if it's a court order, and that's only for criminal cases. But let's take the case of uh, Michael Schumacher. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Formula One driver had a horrible accident. And within hours of his accident, Bild Zeitung, the largest yellow newspaper in Europe, had pictures of his skull and all this thing. I mean, everything, all, everything about his car accident and his health was published there. That would have been impossible here because 
if the data, you know, skull extras, whatever, had been published somewhere, you could immediately tell who accessed that data. And, I mean, there are a limited number of people, I mean, who could do that? And you could say, come here, mm -hmm. how'd you do that? Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the insider threats are always a problem, but because all logons have to be are registered and they, and they are it's programmed so that, you know, if you're not authorized uh, or if it's weird. So obviously sys <coughs> systems administrators do have higher privileges, mm -hmm. but you're still something, you know, something's weird. You, it, it all sends off alarm bells. So we did have this unfortunate case of a policewoman here <clears throat> who had higher system admin privileges, but wasn't smart enough to realize that when she started snooping on her boyfriend's records, alarm bells would go off. And within 15 minutes of accessing her boyfriend's records, boom, mm. there she was, you know, sort of being escorted out of the building, criminal case, found guilty. And my last act as president was actually to give her a pardon because you know, it was kind of, hmm. she did. So would it be fair to, to summarize that to create a digitally advanced country like Estonia, what you need is vision, strong leadership, and um, to try to minimize legacy? Yeah. Well, there's more. Mm -hmm. The third pillar, I argue, is, uh, which, is, which no one thinks about, unfortunately, or some of us do, <clears throat> which is data integrity. Uh, the problem, I mean, this, the Europe and the United States are obsessed with privacy. I, I mean, that's fine. But privacy is about someone finding out my blood type, finding out my bank account. Integrity is someone changing the record of my blood type or changing the, uh, my bank account, and I doubt it would be to make it bigger. Mm. And of course, once you go digital, as we have, this becomes the number one problem because everything is, we have all our laws are available only digitally. We don't print them out anywhere. Uh, all our court cases are all digital. Now, if you go in there and you change a law, change a court case result, or even part of it, I mean, you've changed the entire legal system, not to mention property records and, I mean, everything that we saw. Every, everything we consider critical data, which are health records, property records, courts, laws, um, is on uh, keyless signature infrastructure, which is kind of like a low energy requiring <laughs> form of blockchain, but it's all where hashes are, are the blocks, and so... When we don't know the actual data, but we know it hasn't been changed. And that is, uh, we have been on that since 2008. So, uh, and data integrity becomes the fundamental issue in, um, uh, I mean, in all kinds of areas, but anyway, for, for us, I mean, for, the, for digital, uh, digitization of public services, you must pay attention to the data integrity. So when I look at sort of attempts by other countries to do these things, <laughs> what is the matter with you people? Mm. Don't you worry about this? So, uh, so three pillars largely are, I mean, basically is identity, uh, architecture, and integrity. And since then, we have, uh, we have one more aspect which comes into this overall picture of security, which has largely to do with <laughs> where we live. Um, but there's uh, some people came up with a very clever thing. After the Fukushima mm, tsunami, which either because of the tsunami or because of the meltdown of the reactor, in any case, Japan lost some small percentage of its national data. But the idea of losing your data, that's like really bad. I mean, that's not integrity anymore. That's like there's no more data, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, what we had been doing for years, which was that uh, we realized this problem anyway. So we would once a month or so take all of the nas critical national data and put it on some CD-ROMs and ship them to a couple of embassies. Mm -hmm. they would, then the ambassador would put it into the 
into the safe, and then we'd have so for another in case something happened. Um, and so, in a country like Estonia, uh, which is not that different from Finland, um, I mean, we don't have seismic issues. We're not worried about tsunamis, mm-hmm. earthquakes, or any of those things. I mean, like Greece might worry about it, or Turkey, but we don't have to worry about that. And, but we're a small country, so in the United States, it doesn't have to worry about it either, because, I mean, you can have, like, data here, data there, but we're small, so... Uh, but we have been invaded on an average of twice a century for the past <laughs> thousand years, and, you know. And the last century was kind of like six invasions. Maybe we can sort of skip this for a while. Um, and so, some very clever person figured this out. That um, let's see if we can appealing to the Vienna Convention on Extraterritoriality and Diplomatic Representations. A designate a server, um, an embassy. So we have a huge server. I mean, and then it turned out that you could do this. And mm-hmm. in fact, we have a bilateral agreement with the, with the, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, where we don't have a physical embassy. Well, we have, um, or our physical embassy is a server. We don't have an ambassador there. We covered from because you know Luxembourg's small. Mm-hmm. Even smaller than Estonia, and but the Lux, the server has a twenty four seven dedicated line to Estonia, and so we update all critical national critical data in real time. Hmm. Um, because well, you know, I mean, it's this way. If they invade Luxembourg too, then we're all fucked. Mm. Mm. That's right. <laughs> so that's a data embassy. A data embassy. Yeah. That's that's. All this is, is is fascinating. What other countries would you consider to be similar or close to the level of technical advantages um, uh, to Estonia? Finland. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I don't really know. I mean, basically, okay. I mean, from, from what I understand, I've not seen it, but uh, yes. Um, but Singapore seems to be fairly advanced, but they have a different model, and I'm not sure that's... I mean, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I met their CIO, and she kept telling me, "Oh, you do all that much better." And I go, "Well, I don't know." But anyway, mm-hmm. um, um, but they're small. I mean, so they, I mean, their population is larger, but I mean, somehow that they, they have a different. Their whole governance approach is different, and um. I mean, they. I said a whole long story, but they're they're so different from liberal democratic governments mm. in in the West uh, that um, I don't know if we can compare other countries. Well, I, basically, I mean, on uh, in the private sector, many countries are ahead of us. It, just in the public sector, I mean, the new Desi report, which is digital European, blah blah blah. I don't know. Anyway, it comes out once a year. And Estonia is not so hot overall because of a lot of problems we have, uh, especially when it comes to use of um, of uh, commercial e services. But when it comes, but e governance, anything public services, we remain and have been every year number one, and basically Finland is number two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and Denmark's up there too. So those are the the top. Um, Which is actually related to what I see where we should be going. Which is, uh, people say, well, what is the next thing Estonia is going to do? And I go, well, I don't know what the next thing is. I mean, I do know some of the things we're working on are uh, proactive public services, uh, AI-based services. Like, hey, it's time to renew your driver's license, which mm. is about as basic as you can get. But More interesting things uh, that you know we noticed. This is happening. I mean, one idea in taxation is well, things are not going so well for your company. Why don't you come on in? Because we noticed that you know you're. I mean, that re- does require online, real time reporting of economic results. But this, and it's going to be probably stymied by the accounting industry because basically, instead of quarterly reports, you can actually 
I mean, the way we're set up right now, anyway, all records have to, are digital. You can only submit, and you must submit all business records digitally. Once you have that, why do you need an accountant? Because it just like comes in and comes out. Mm. Um, I think that uh, CBDBs will again, for political reasons, uh, which are. Um, at the CBDCs, uh, central bank digital currencies is one way we should be going, but we will not because the commercial banking sector will never allow it mm. because there's so much money to be lost if you don't have that. I mean, if you don't have, <laughs> if you don't need a bank to, to be the, the kind of the intermediary and all transactions can be done directly via the central bank in frankfurt mm. um why do you need, why do i have to need, why do i need a bank i don't uh so that's not going to happen um but certain things need must happen and um one of them is the digitization uh the the cross-border digitization of public services 10 years ago um uh, when finland adopted more or less the um for digital, uh, digital prescriptions, uh, the X-Road, mm -hmm. I went to President Ninista. He said, Sally, look, you have digital prescriptions? We have digital prescriptions. Every year there are 7 million visits from Finns to Estonia, except we, we have COVID, but otherwise mm -hmm. 7 million visits. And there only are 5 million of you. So, I mean... <laughs> And of course, you know, we have a lot of Estonians here, and why don't we do it so that, uh, what, I mean, since we have the same system, and we can make this work, we have, you know, a digital prescription for Finland will work in Estonia. So Finland, Finn comes here, has a good time, has a headache, wants to get, I mean, he has some medicine he needs, or he lost his heart medicine, whatever, he goes and, you know, IDs himself at the pharmacy and, you know, gets his medicine. President needs a great idea. All right, so this would technologically take, what, a week or two weeks to set this up? Mm -hmm. I mean, it took nine years. <laughs> and this shows the problem, though, yeah, is that basically, okay, they're, they're the, the non-digital problems of the analog world. Finland subsidizes some medicines to, for a certain group, age group, say, mm. for a certain amount. We have, we subsidize, you know, another form of blood pressure medicine for a slightly different age group and a different amount. Not to work that out so you don't start getting arbitrage and you start abusing the single market in order to get cheaper medicine. <laughs> Took a lot of work. And then, of course, all the usual bureaucratic hassles. So it took nine years. Mm. We have gotten to the point where nine, I mean, rather, four countries have mutually, have mutual digital um, prescriptions uh, Estonia, Finland, Croatia, and Portugal. Uh, don't ask me why. <laughs> But those are the countries that, uh, that have mutual sort of digital prescriptions. Now, probably because they probably have a similar digital architecture, I bet. But in any case, now, first, the first thing, I mean, okay, we have the Schengen Agreement. That's, we all love it. I mean, no border, I mean, no border checks. I'm old enough to actually remember border checks mm. you know, going from Germany to the Netherlands, you know, and then they... Everyone has to show their passport, going to Austria. Uh, so we, that we should have that. So, I mean, it makes life in Europe much easier. And every, if you get sick somewhere, and I mean, you know, I don't know, I at least have had the experience of getting, like, I, get, I had to give a speech in Strasbourg, and then I got sick and I couldn't, my throat was just completely, <laughs> and it was like, so, uh, I mean, what you, what you do that right now is that you have to go find a doctor who will then tell you that, okay, here's some penicillin, I mean, doing all that. Whereas I could just, I'm a doctor, so I need this, and put that in, and then I just go to a French pharmacy, ID myself, and I get the mm -hmm. antibiotic. And let's take that now to medicine. Um, I go to Greece, I get sick, and, you know, uh, I was... 
right now, it's like, first of all, I have to find a doctor, speaks English, okay, maybe that's not so bad, but then it's like, what are my medical records? What's this? What are you allergic to? What have you had? Whereas um, if, I mean, in this world, it has been technologically feasible for 20 years now already, you go there and authorize, you know, Yanis, whatever his name, Doctoropolis. Here, you are authorized to look at my medical records. He goes, look, logs on, looks at, he gets my medical records. They are already translated into Greek mm. automatically mm. because from because he's not going to read Estonian. I mean, mm -hmm. my medical records are in Estonian. So these are no-brainer, no-brainer, technologically, currently feasible solutions that would make life so much easier in the EU. And we don't think about these things. We think about, ooh, let's get Google and Facebook. I mean, that's fine. I have nothing, I mean, I'm no fan of, um, of Facebook or Google. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, if that is all the European Union concerns itself with, I mean, we have this, the DSA, the Digital Services Act, which was just passed this year. The Digital Services Act, I saw the name before I knew what it was about. I said, oh, finally, we're going to figure out how to get digital services in Europe across borders. No, it's all about screwing GAFA. Again, I am no particular, I mean, I have no, you know, brief for GAFA. Fine, but don't call it a Digital Services Act. Call it a Digital Fuck the Americans Act. Mm. But, uh, you know. They couldn't call it that. Dafa, it would be great, you know. <laughs> uh, but but it's not a digital services act by any means. It is not. There are. It has nothing to do with digital services. So I mean, it's a broader problem, as I sort of alluded to earlier, with the European Union, is that it has no idea about the 21st century and digital services, except for the bad things that American companies may be doing. Hmm. Um, but in the EU, right, for years already, every piece of legislation must be looked at on its impact for climate. Man, yeah, great idea. I mean, I think it's wonderful. No legislation has to be looked at, and even if it were, it would be ignored, for its effect on security, especially digital security. Because, you know, other things, you don't have to worry about tanks for legislation, but anything that requires digital should be looked at from through the prism of what are the impacts of this on, on, uh, on uh, I mean, from a digital security perspective. And a perfect example, again, in this kind of knee-jerk anti-Americanism, you have, you have just passed uh, the, the, the um, what is it, Digital Markets Act, which basically says that um, we have to make the level playing field for competition. We're going to just lower the standard instead of raising it. Mm. So you have side loading, so which means it's already been abused. It's like, oh no, Apple, Apple has to vet apps. That's bad. That's bad for a competition. We should, you should be like Android and you just take everything. And then what do you do? I mean, then you find <laughs> Chinese apps <laughs> that you can sideload, bring in without, you know, any vetting. And you're like, is that smart? I mean, but the people are like, they're obsessed with like, we have to show those Americans that we're more powerful. Fine, show the Americans you're more powerful. Make, re require everyone, to, every, com I mean, all companies, all technologies to have some minimal standard of vetting. I mean, you do it for phytosanitary controls. Why don't you do it for this? But no, uh, hating American companies is too big a thing uh, to, to worry about the security of European citizens. There is also maybe the point that majority of the people don't understand to which length companies like Apple actually go when they're vetting those applications, that they, they do a lot of really, really impressive stuff in order to make their users safe and secure. And many people don't really think about it at all. They just get the user experience as an end user. Well, we, I mean, uh, 
people not thought about these things. Uh, and especially, I don't know, maybe on this, I'll, I'll, my last tirade, <laughs> the problem with the world today <laughs> comes down to a not very good, but still sort of an original essay written in 1959 by a British physical chemist and literary novelist named C.P. Snow. Charles Percy, Charles Pierce Snow, what name? His name is known as C.P. Snow. And he was, uh, he was at Cambridge University and he was a physical chemist. And then he would, but he was also a literary novelist. And in fact, he, I found out much later, coined the term the corridors of power. I always thought that was Shakespearean. You know, mm. it sounds like a sea change, a corridors of power. Well, no, he invented it or he created it and was in the title of one of his novels. And now everyone says, in the corridors of power. Um, but he wrote an essay in 1959. I said it was not very good. It was very, but, it was, uh, but it highlighted a problem that was minor back then. It was the problem of the university between the humanities and the sciences. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how he, I mean, he bridged them. He was thinking that he's a physical chemist. So he talks about sitting around at dinner with, you know, physicists and chemists and probably discussing the latest of in quantum mechanics in 1959. But because he wrote novels, he would go over and sit with the poets and the novelists and the English professors. And he said like, well, the physicist novels didn't, I mean, the physicist, physicists didn't care at all about what the literary guys were doing. And literary guys were going like, well, if we only knew what they were doing, I mean, we'd maybe be interested in it. Uh, but this was in 1959 when technology had no real impact on society. I mean, when you left your house, your phone was back there, it was attached to the wall, and no one knew where you were. Whereas today, <laughs> everywhere you go, where you are is known. Mm -hmm. um, I remember personally, I mean, as a kid, I don't know, 11, 12, reading 1984. Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, how ridiculous a TV looking at me. What is that? And it's like, well, how's that work? <laughs> that would well, never happen. <laughs> right? Well, you know, I mean, so, so um, we live in a world permeated by technology and the people who, um, I mean, the people, there's people who write our laws, do governance and all the other stuff that doesn't require knowledge of math or science have no clue, no clue whatsoever. And the people who design technology, um, well, they don't really think much about ethics. I mean, if you look at Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, mm. not to mention, uh, you know, sort of the, the, P, the PLA, um and um you know what's nso mm. the israeli company mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. i mean they specifically they really don't care about ethics so, uh, i mean we are living in the the problem of two cultures and we still live in an analog world where we live by laws that are written by human beings and the human beings uh, probably last studied math when they were in eighth grade. All right, let's talk about cyber defense. What do you think? What are the main ingredients for a successful and robust cyber defense? Well, the first thing is, I would argue, is the architecture of defense, which is that if you look at this world of threats in cyber, including, I mean, first of all, there is, we have to understand there's a continuum beginning with basically crypto or cryptography, hacking, actually the hack, what kind of hacking, then you have like DDoS attacks, which basically is you know, sort of the opposite where you don't get access to, to information operations, disinformation. And the problem is that in the liberal democratic West, we do not think of this as a continuum. 
every single one has its own academic discipline. It has its own separate response in defense. It has its own response in NATO. And they don't talk to each other much. Mm. Uh, whereas if you look at the Russians and the Chinese, mm -hmm. their, their strategy or their whole concept is this is all a continuum. We do one or we do another. And then so it's all kind of, yes, it's one flows into the other. A perfect example of the siloization of, of this is that we have here in Tallinn the, the NATO Center of Excellence for Cyber Defense, of which Finland is a member, by the way. But, mm -hmm. And then we have the NATO Center of Excellence in Stratcom mm -hmm. in Riga. Great. So anyway, a couple of, two years ago, I'm going like, hmm, there's this thing that's coming up. I think, I mean, it may be that we don't have to be so worried about it now looking at it. But back then I was like, oh my God, this is the next thing. Deep fakes. Mm -hmm. So I went, you know, I called up the guy at the cyber center. I said, so what are you, what are you doing on, on uh, deep fakes? Because after all, it's kind of AI. And blah, blah. Anyway, the answer came back after a while. No, we don't deal with that. That's content. We don't deal with content. We just deal with the, the, the technical side of hacking. Call up or write email to more accurately to the Stratcom Center. So, mm -hmm. what are you doing about deep fakes? You know, new threat. Well, actually, that's technical. We deal with content. And so you end up even in this realm, you're, you're just, we don't understand the continuum. Mm -hmm. So, that's one dimension. The other dimension. Uh, which is orthogonal, is the primitive concept of today of borders. Mm. The cyber defense is almost always done strictly at the national level. Supranational cyber defense, I mean, there's, there are five eyes. Even that is not that deep, but it, it is at least five countries <clears throat> all Anglo-Saxon, uh, that share information, uh, and none of them are anymore in the EU. True. And here, but on the other hand, APT28 and APT29 have attacked the State Department. They've attacked the, the Auswärtigesamt, the Bundestag, the mm -hmm. Congress. They've attacked the Dutch foreign ministry, the Danish foreign ministry, the Italian foreign ministry. I mean, this go on. The, Bunde, the German think tanks, Stiftungen. I mean, those are just things that, I mean, I just pick up and go, oh, they did that too. You know, and they even attacked WADA, the World Anti-Doping mm -hmm. Agency. Mm -hmm. Why did APT 28 or 29, I don't know which one it was, but anyway, attacked WADA. Well, it's because they had bad inf I mean, information on the state-run doping of athletes at the Olympics, and they really didn't want that to come up. All right, so then the other dimension is that we all, we all have our own little thing. We don't share information. It has gotten better now, but in 2011, we discovered here in our military network a Russian worm. And so, obviously, you know, NATO, we go, hi, we've discovered this Russian worm in our military networks. And the answer or the response was, oh, you too. Wrong response, mm -hmm. wrong mm -hmm. response. <laughs> I, I remember analyzing Agent BDZ at the time, so. Okay. Remember the case very well. Well, the point is that the, uh, if you don't do cyber, I mean, you're not, you, don't do, you don't do defense when you, A, do not talk to other people who are your allies, and you don't talk outside of your sphere. Mm -hmm. And you're only doing one thing. And so until we resolve that, we're screwed, basically. Because if we don't know that someone else has discovered something somewhere, um, well, what do we do? I, so, I mean, well, this does have a solution, which is that, I mean, when you start thinking about where we are, 
cyber threats has completely changed the the world of threats. Um, NATO, which you are joining too late. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Why is it the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? It's not that this part of the world is so wonderful and lovely. It's because of tank and troop movement logistics. It's because of bomber range, fly, fighter refueling. I mean, all basically logistics. That's, what, that's why it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it's not because, I mean, there are lots of wonderful democracies in the world. I mean, Japan is not in NATO. I mean, mm. everyone, sometimes you run into people and say, well, Japan is in NATO. Well, that's because it's in the wrong place. It's not by and <laughs> uh, And so living, putting those two together, I mean, the point is that since we no longer really, I mean, it's, or my other favorite line for using, when I talk, said, look, Tallinn, Torino, Toronto, Topeka, Tokyo, and Taipei are all equidistant in this new world. An attack on one is as immediate as an attack on the other, mm. if someone wants to attack. Well, so I think the way out of this and what we should be pushing for is an alliance of democracies. I mean, we don't have to have this problem of sort of a logistics-based defense organization known as NATO having members that are not democratic. Mm. You can give it and pull it. You can, you can give it to someone or you can pull it out. It's like this. You want cyber defense? Yes, okay. You don't want cyber defense? But it should be, we should have a new security organization architecture I think that is based on values because the threats now are so cross-border and so uh, immediate that we don't have to think about geography mm. at all. Mm. Uh, and that's, I, I mean, I hope we start going in that direction. Now, the other thought on this is also, I think that NATO is uniquely inadequate for cyber defense because so much of cyber defense depends on legislation. And, I mean, this is where the EU actually has a leg up. I mean, we have all these silly PESCOs and all these other sort of European defense things which never work because this, it cannot work. And especially with you guys joining in, I mean, who's going to be in the EU that's not in NATO, you know? Mm. Ireland and Austria. I mean, that's it, right? That's Everyone, it, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, the European defense as proposed in strategic autonomy, uh, or autonomy strategic, I don't know how it is. Uh, it doesn't make really much sense, um, except when it comes to cyber, where in fact the EU could be the leader, or it should be, because you can actually do the necessary legislation to, to make, because we do have a mechanism for creating legislation, which then, I mean, other countries can take over. We've seen it with GDPR. The U.S. basically is taking over GDPR. Mm -hmm. California already has, I mm -hmm. mean, many years ago. Uh, so, yes, this is, this is where we should be heading, but we need awareness of this. And so while the U EU is uniquely poised to actually create the legislative framework for creating genuine cyber defense, people don't know anything about cyber. <laughs> and they pass silly legislation that uh, shows no understanding of security in the digital realm. But we do have a much better possibility to actually create that security than any other organization that currently exists. Mm. So you're saying that Finland is joining NATO too late, but um, better, better late than never, Thomas. <laughs> However, I would, I would say, no, I mean, uh, too late meaning really that, I mean, these threats, unfortunately, as we've seen with Ukraine, Kinetic threats have not gone away. It's just that now we have, since the year two, since Moonlit Mile or Moonlight Mile, I mean, we have seen, which is the first thing I know about, right? I mean, I mean, the, the Russian, uh, Russian um, 
uh, worm or whatever it was, a hack uh, of Moonlight Maze. Maze, right? Yeah. Not a Moonlight Mile is a Rolling Stone song from <laughs> from Sticky Fingers. Right, right. Maybe we can play it in the background here when we do the ending. Moonlight Maze, right? Yeah, Moonlight yeah. Mind is a, is a song with you know sort of a, kind of a slow song. Yeah. Anyway, a Moonlight Maze, <laughs> and <laughs> but I mean since then. I mean, I, there, I'm sure there's, there were things beforehand. It's just no one admitted anything. Mm -hmm. But okay, Moonlight Maze is public information. I mean, that's 20 years, a mm -hmm. little more than 20 years. Um, and it's all changed. But we still have kinetic war, as Ukraine shows, and we still need that stuff. So it's not too late. It's just that, mm, well, we... I mean, it's just, it's worse. Now. Mm. So has anything surprised you about the, the cyber activity in, in Ukraine during this war? Um, yes and no. I mean, I mean, there are a number of articles. No, there, have, there hasn't been cyber activity. But this is the problem with cyber activity, which as you know from Finland and from we know very well in Estonia, um, <clears throat> the fact that you are not noticing cyber attacks doesn't mean they're happening. Mm. It just means your defense is good. And this is, uh, I mean, the history of uh, cyber attacks on Ukraine um, go back to much more peaceful times. I mean, in 2015, I don't know which oblast it was, but anyway, it's, they knocked out, I think it was in, which book was it? It was in David Sanger's book. Anyway, they knocked out an oblast electrical system mm -hmm. and it was just like, what? And uh, we actually immediately that same day dispatched uh, some of our top people to to Kiev um, because I mean they didn't they didn't really quite know what was going on and uh, they realized it had to be digital but you know where it was and since you know we have that since 2007. <laughs> We have lots of experience. Of course, it's a different kind of attack, but uh, but nonetheless, we have. Uh, I mean, we have been kind of the sort of one of the point men, people on uh, on cyber attacks. And so, when uh, when we, it, it is not that um, Russia is is not constantly using cyber attacks, and it's really a piece. Yesterday, there's some other kind of new round of something going on, and of course, they have hacked all of the telephone networks and so forth. It's kind of an odd situation because, on the one hand, the Ukrainians have hacked their telephone networks, and mm -hmm. in fact, they use mobile telephone networks because their own uh, encrypted military communication is so crappy. Mm -hmm doesn't work, so then you end up having people in the field using mobile phones and using, in fact, the Ukrainian networks. And then, of course, the Ukrainians are, oh, okay. <laughs> and, in fact, even targeting using the, uh, the uh, geolocation of uh, the Russian, uh, Russian users of the Ukrainian networks. Mm. Um, but they're still killing people with kinetic means, so... Um, Yeah, real world still matters. Right. Well, maybe there's something we can teach you. Is there anything you would like to ask from us? I, I mean, there are all kinds of things that are interesting. Uh, I would say, uh, given my experience on how things can be built up across borders, I've always kind of thought that maybe the way to go is, I mean, let, us, let us not be satisfied with the EU, let us not be satisfied with NATO, but in fact, why don't we create an integrated cyber defense among a small group of countries that can later on be joined, just as you can expand NATO, you can expand the EU, I mean, you can actually start off with two countries that actually get it. And then go on. I don't know if it's a question. There's more a proposal. Why don't we do that? Why can't we do that? I mean, I would say one of the answers is that Finland really hasn't figured out yet that maybe Estonia is equal, an equal partner. It's a very difficult thing for, for has been a very difficult thing for Europe, for Finnish politicians to, to realize. Um, but, but anyway, it's slowly moving there. Um, but anyway, I don't know. Why don't we do that? I mean, that's not a question of sort of um, 
that I would get an answer, but I mean, I'm saying, why don't we do that? I actually think that on a private side, like on a meaning commercial entities, people have figured that out already long ago. Like well, it's some, also on the on the uh, NGO side. I mean, yeah. the uh, NIIS, whatever that stands for, but it's the common Estonian, Finnish, and plus some other countries now. Yeah. Um, uh, X Road open source creation Nordic group. Institute for Interoperability Services right yeah so so there are some initiatives i think the 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 utopia we had when internet started growing and and we started realizing that we for the first time in a long while have something really and truly global where you know everybody on the planet who has the technology can access the same and access the same networks Slowly but surely, the utopia has waned off, and we've started to realize that borders still very much exist, and and there are limits to the kind of interoperability we have. So I I still think the dream lives on, and maybe one day we will have the kind of joint defense among friendly nations that you 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 hope for. But it's it's I guess still far away. Yes, that's why I say you have to build it step by step. Uh, I mean, with a small group of countries that get it and worry. I mean, so presumably I would say smaller, less arrogant countries that are better than the larger, (laughs) better (laughs) in this area than the larger, um, larger countries that actually are pretty, pretty bad despite their opinion of themselves. and certainly, I think uh, when it comes to Europe, that um, if we were to finally focus on what we are good at, which is the public sector side, I mean, we're terrible when it comes to the private sector. And I mean, uh, it, I mean, it's the disaster that we have no private sector. I mean, no big companies, and but that has thing that has to do with stuff that isn't. Doesn't ha- you can't legislate. It has to do with the fact that there's no real private equity being invested in Europe, whereas, you know, I mean, I would say the example I bring. Mm. Imagine this guy walking into Deutsche Bank in 1975, and he's got long hair, and he doesn't wash because he says, I don't believe in washing. And he walks into Deutsche Bank and said, my friend Steve, or was, Steve, my name's Steve too. I have this idea. We can a personal computer. I'm building it in my garage. And I'm, what does it take? Fifteen seconds or forty-five seconds before whoosh, out the door, right? On the other hand, you have you know the U.S. a wash in private equity, and someone says, "Oh, well, that guy's crazy," but uh, give him a couple hundred thousand, you know. I mean, yeah. see what he does. You, I mean, people leave. Uh, I mean, I talked about people coming back to Estonia. Well, they left Estonia in the first place because they had really good ideas, and then they went and they went to they went where the money was. They went to where the money was, and uh, I read an article about a, a, a just a, sort of a last year student at Tallinn Technical University, and he had. He had this crazy idea, and he had just gotten two hundred fifty thousand dollars investment in it. And I was president, and I said, "Well, you know, this is great, right? I mean, here, come have tea hmm. or coffee or something." So he came, and said, great, I'm really impressed. You know, you're young, entrepreneur, techie, and he said, "Yeah, well, thank you, uh, uh, but I'm sorry, I'm moving to the United States in two weeks." I said, "Why are you doing that?" <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, first of all, there's no real market here, and there's like in the United States, I get money to be invested. I said, yeah, well, I have to admit, you're right. So he went. And six months later, he had six million dollars invented invested in his company. Six months after leaving Estonia, as a 23 year old, Mm -hmm. he was he went. He decided he would go to Cambridge, Mass, right next to MIT, Mm -hmm. because it was an engineering product. Um, I mean. Grabcad was the name of it, which was uh, basically uh, mechanical engineering plus eBay or something. Okay. Plus, I don't know. Sort of, you could, you uh, companies would put out sort of bids. We want a new door handle for Porsche. 
And then all the mechanical engineers go, oh, new, and they design it, and then one of them would be, Porsche would accept it. Anyway, mm. so that was kind of the idea. Uh, and then three years later, he sold the company for over $100 million. I mean, there's... Yes, you do. Well, some, <laughs> some <laughs> people do. Well, my only point is, like, I mean, this is, you're not going to legislate, uh, legislate unicorns through, uh, through uh, like, screwing the Americans. Now, in fact, I think that's the big stumbling block for much of our security issues, that we do not understand where the competition is. The future world in IT and digital will be a competition between the United States and China. It could be the United States and Europe against China. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be Russia. I mean, the kinetic world, we're going to continue to have a kinetic nuisance and you know war crimes and atrocities from Russia, but we don't really have to worry about Russia as a competitive threat. Yes, they have great hackers, no, but they're not going to invent anything. There are no competitions or the world economy is going to come from Russia in this area. They're good at killing people, but not at anything else. Mm. The competition between the United States and China, and China sees the United States as its only adversary, and the United States sees China as its only adversary. And the question is, for us, will the 500 million people living on this continent be a part of that, or will one of them simply take us over? And we seem to be fighting the Americans, who are basically still believe in liberal democracy, far more than we worry about um, Huawei penetrating our networks. Right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion and a unique opportunity for us. Thank you, President Thomas Hendrik Ilves. Oh, it's great to be here. The embers are starting to die down and it's time to extinguish the candles. It's been our pleasure to host you all this evening. We would love to hear from you comments, feedback, and most unreasonable requests. All those can be submitted at gentlemanhackers.com. Your hosts tonight were Mikko Hyppönen and Tomi Tuominen. Gentlemen Hackers would like to wish you good luck and good night.